Hello and welcome from London. Uh, I'm Gideon Rachman of the Financial Times. Uh, by the magic of Zoom, I'm able to bring you a global panel on restoring economic growth. We have an incredible panel uh, all over the world. To briefly introduce them, there's uh, Taman Shanmugaratnam, the Senior Minister of Singapore, um, Shmriti Irani, the Minister of Women for India, Haruhiki Kuroda in Tokyo, the Governor of the Bank of Japan, and uh, Andre Kostin in Moscow of VTB Bank. Uh, we've only got 45 minutes. You're uh, watching around the world are welcome to participate. So do send questions to the chat function and I'll get to them later. But let me get straight to it. Uh, Senior Minister Shana Garatnam, um, we've had this incredible pandemic induced global recession. The session's called Restoring Economic Growth. What do you think the prospects are of uh, a rebound in the global economy over the next year? Well, thanks, uh, Gideon. I think we have to pay less attention to uh, projections, or if you like, central forecasts of growth, uh, and think more in terms of uh, uh, the range of possibilities. In other words, think of uncertainty. Um, when we shape public policy, when we shape the way we um, uh, think generally. Uh, last year, we had a very wide range of uh, possible outcomes, and I think governments acted forthrightly through both monetary and fiscal policies to at least put a bottom to the possible uh, collapse, uh, both in economies but in public morale as well. And the public health measures, of course, took first priority. I'd say this year, the, 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 the cone of possibilities is not as wide, but it's still very wide. Uh, no one can pretend uh, to project what global growth or even national growth will really be like over the course of the year, because so much depends on the virus, not just within our own countries, but internationally. And I'd say the key uncertainty that we, have, we face now is when are we going to achieve herd immunity internationally. And if it's not achieved nationally, internationally, no one is safe within individual nations either. Vaccine rollout is proceeding, I would say, much faster than expected in the advanced economies than was expected even six months ago. But we, are, we still have a huge challenge in the developing world and for much of the world's population. Vaccine distribution is uh, nowhere where we'd like it to be. Um, but even in the advanced countries, a key question remains as to what the take-up rates are going to be for vaccines. I think they will eventually have supply. I mean, the US, UK, France, and so on are going to eventually have enough supply. But the, there's a very serious question as to what take-up rates will be, because to get herd immunity, uh, you need, I mean, I'm not the expert, but the medical scientists tell us you need something like 75%, 70 percent of the population at least. And now with the more transmissible variants of the virus, uh, you need significantly more than that. And if you need, let's say, 80 percent of the population uh, to be for herd immunity, it means you've got to vaccinate more than 80 percent because it's not a 100 percent effective vaccine. So we're quite far away from being able to talk about the end of this crisis. The light is there at the end of the tunnel, but it's still a long tunnel ahead. And we have to expect shocks along the way. We're already seeing a shock in this first quarter. We're seeing further setbacks and further lockdowns in many economies. It's not going to be a smooth path. So think in terms of a world of uncertainty. Be prepared for further setbacks and ensure that public policy is still there to protect the weakest. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Minister Irani in, in, in Delhi, I mean, we just heard from Singapore there, the view that vaccination is the key. Is that, is that how it seems to you and how are things going in India, which after all is producing a lot of the world's vaccine? Thank you. I think that when nations are faced with challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic, there were positions from which fear spoke. 
And today, with the advent of the vaccine and especially the presumptions made of a nation as diverse such as ours, that the numbers who will die because of the pandemic in our country will be so large that it will be difficult for governments to come together and adapt to challenges or adapt and bring about solutions. I think India has effectively projected to the world that when the citizenry and the government come together, much can be done. I also feel reflecting on the uh, proposition of Minister Singapore that when you look at policy creation, we have in the past one year learned to adapt to these kind of disruptions. And I feel that this is the ability to adapt within administration, within our citizens and our communities is what gives me hope that further disruption can be qualitatively met. Yes, uh, when you speak about India producing the vaccine, apart from ensuring that our frontline workers are vaccinated, we are also committed under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister to help our neighborhood come to terms with solutions with regards to the pandemic. But I think policies, be it fiscal or health, COVID-19 has brought the world together in sharing best practices, in reaching out to each other, and in ensuring that this disruption does not engulf in its wake every economy. But I also feel that the distinction between so-called advanced economies and developing nations is a distinction that is being slowly eroded. Today, competence is being measured by citizens globally. Uh, and best practices, like I said, are being shared willingly by administrations across the world. So when I speak of my country, I think one of the greatest support systems that came through for the administration and our citizens was the use of technology to ensure that services reach far and wide, technology to ensure that government and citizens communicate effectively, and also the rollout that you see of the vaccine right now is also enabled and uh, supported through our frontline workers, through the pharmaceutical industry, and like I said, those who have dedicated themselves to fighting this pandemic with the aid of technology. So I think time has come to recognize that we have faced this disruption very bravely. The fact that we are united in our fight against this pandemic. And yes, we are picking up the pieces of an economy that has been shattered across the world. But nonetheless, we are hopeful and we are buoyant that we will set the house in order. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Governor Kuroda in, in Tokyo, I mean, it seems in, in every crisis recently, a lot of uh, the burden of coping falls on central banks. Looking at uh, COVID-19 and uh, what's happening now, what do you think the appropriate monetary and, and fiscal policies are for, for responding? Yes, uh, <clears throat> you may know that, uh, that Japan has been affected by this COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, significantly. Although uh, the total number of uh, uh, <clears throat> infection as far as total number of fatalities uh, stay uh, left below compared with uh, other um, developed countries. For instance, uh, total number of fatalities is about 5,000 uh, within uh, the population of 120 million. However, the economy has been significantly and substantially affected by the pandemic, and we uh, experienced uh, significant uh, negative growth in the second quarter of last year. Uh, then in the third quarter, the economy showed uh, uh, recovery, but then uh, the, the resurgence of uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, the, 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 the uh, state of emergency uh, <coughs> declaration by the government uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, would uh, uh, again uh, uh, tend to uh, dampen the economic uh, recovery. In this kind of situation, of course, the uh, most important uh, economic policy is to maintain uh, uh, employment and avoid uh, unemployment and uh, the, 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 the uh, corporate uh, uh, failure and so on and so forth. So the government uh, uh, already uh, implemented uh, 
huge amount of uh, <coughs> fiscal uh, support, uh, maybe uh, totaling uh, uh, to around uh, 40% of GDP. At the same time, the Bank of Japan provided huge amount of liquidity to the banking sector, and also uh, we uh, uh, try to uh, stabilize the financial markets. And both the government policy and the Bank of Japan monetary policy, I think, have been uh, fairly successful in uh, stabilizing the market and, and avoiding uh, 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 corporate failures, uh, maintaining employment at a relatively uh, high level. Uh, unemployment rate is still about uh, nine, uh, 3% only. Uh, so, uh, so far, uh, the a combination of, uh, of expansionary uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy uh, have been successfully maintaining the, the situation as stable. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, basically, we have to uh, uh, overcome, contain uh, this uh, uh, pandemic, as uh, uh, Minister Haman uh, uh, emphasized, uh, through uh, vaccination and the creation of immunity uh, <coughs> uh, in, in, in the country. And that is a challenge uh, still uh, faced by uh, Japan as well as the Japanese government. Thank you, Governor Kuroda. Uh, Mr. Kostin in Moscow, how, how have you, uh, the, the economy, been coping in, in Russia? I mean, uh, Obviously, everybody's taken a, a huge hit. Have you managed to contain it, do you think? Can you unmute, I think? Uh, yeah, hello, yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my 25th annual meeting in Davos. And of course, it's quite unusual. Um, for many years, we discussed um, viruses as potential risk for the global economy. But uh, to tell you frankly, I think we uh, underestimated those risks. We, over the last couple of years, we more focused on uh, fifth industrial revolution, uh, on digitalization, and we didn't even notice a tiny virus which destroyed all our expectations for profits, for economic growth. And now we have to deal with a quite a unique um, a new situation. And I think we should focus more on this now. I think that uh, as the financial crisis 2007-2008 led to a decision by G20 on Basel III to provide financial stability, I think similar efforts should be done within the G20 and other um, international um, uh, institutions, not only World Health Organization, in order to create a new order uh, to protect, uh, for health protection, for cooperation, uh, in the world. Uh, coming back to your uh, question about Russia, I think Russia is um, uh, doing quite reasonably well, if we can say so. Uh, if you come to Moscow, you will find the, all the shops, all the restaurants, uh, all the theaters, uh, starting from the Bolshoi, are opened, uh, unlike um, um, many other countries. So Russian economy is unlocked after we have a lockdown in May, uh, in, in, in April, May. And um, our health system is, um, is, is coping with this. But I have to add that I think it's an important lesson for uh, business as well. I think um, private uh, medical care showed uh, quite an impressive uh, results. Uh, many private hospitals were very quickly converted into COVID hospitals. The famous Moscow Maternity Hospital was within two weeks converted into um, COVID hospital. And uh, some businessmen, I think wisely enough, uh, built uh, for their own employees, they built COVID hospitals, like Russell company, for example, built six or seven hospitals for their employees in Siberia. And I think we just showed that we definitely need more efforts, common efforts in order to combat the virus. And um, we very much hope that, for example, we will not have the geopolitical competition about the vaccine. You know, Russia invented vaccine quite quickly, and there are many debates about, you know, who's the best, who will be the first. I think that's not the issue. I think 
uh, just um, as, as the minister earlier mentioned uh, about the problem of vaccination and particularly for less developed, uh, for, for developing countries, I think it's quite important now uh, to find a solution for these and to, to produce as many vaccines possible and uh, to achieve the uh, equal uh, distribution of this vaccine and make it uh, available for, for everybody. And, uh, of course, um, it's good news that, that Madam Merkel recently spoke to Mr. Putin about the, the joint effort. We hope that that will result in a more cooperation between the West and Russia, for example, on this issue. Um, but uh, for Russia is planning to come back to economic growth this year, about 3.7%, probably, after the negative growth last year, 4%, uh, driven mainly by the um, resource economy. Of course, uh, the prices, you see international prices are good, uh, starting from oil and finishing with aluminium, nickel, and others. So we feel uh, reasonably uh, optimistic about this, and we hope that by autumn, the Russian economy uh, will return to the pre-crisis uh, level. Thank you very much. Now, um, Taman, in, in Singapore, I mean, one of the most extraordinary aspects of this crisis is something we've all <laughs> had to get used to, and particularly a Davos audience, which I assume was always on a plane, is that the complete, almost complete cessation of international travel. And for Singapore, which is a kind of global hub, a trading hub, a travel hub, that must have been particularly uh, a stark shock. I mean, how much can the world economy get back to something approaching normal um, without, without travel? Is that, is that absolutely key? And, and when can that be restored? And do you think, sorry, this is kind of portmanteau question, is it realistic to think from Singapore's point of view or from the world point of view that eventually we'll go back to where we were? Or, or do you think we're looking at permanent changes in how we do things? I think it'll be a long time before we get back to normal which also means economies at full capacity uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, travel uh, is part and parcel uh, of the modern world and the flow of knowledge. Um, and it's not just leisure, it's part of the productive global economy. Um, for countries like Singapore, of course, it's critical. Um, it's part of our, it's, it's uh, it's how the blood flows through the economy. But uh, what's important, I think, is that we recognize, too, that globally, no, no economy, including the most advanced economies, are going to get back to normal until the large part of the world that we call developing, and particularly the developing world outside China, uh, recovers from this crisis. In the last 20 years, the emerging world outside China contributed about a third of global growth with everyone benefiting from it. And if you look at the next 10 years, next 20 years, that's where the largest opportunities for growth are. That's where the largest opportunities for growth are. So it's in everyone's interest that we first get past this crisis in the developing world. Second, very importantly, that we invest in infrastructure, we invest in, in international networks, we invest in globalization for the developing world so as to create a whole new phase of growth for those economies as well as for the global economy. Okay, th thank you very much. And uh, Minister Irani in, in Delhi, I mean, on this question of, of scarring of the economy, is it perhaps we're too much still in the middle of the crisis to be able to make an assessment. But do you uh, worry that a lot of businesses will, will never come back from the shock that's been, been visited upon them? I think what needs to be said is that India was habituated to administrative and economical pronouncements annually in our budget. And in the entire year that went by, because of the pandemic, we had our finance ministry and our government on a monthly basis come out with aid and support for businesses big and small. Additionally, I think one needs to flag the fact that one of the biggest challenges that was foreseen in March 2020 was the day-to-day -day needs of the poor citizens of our country, those who are a, a part of our rural economy. 
And I believe that the pronouncement by the Honorable Prime Minister in late March that over 800 million Indians will receive free food for eight months brought a lot of respite to especially rural populations. Additionally, recognizing that the needs of women, especially those in poorer families, need to be met, cash transfers were uh, given by the government to over 220 million women across the country for three months. Recognizing that people spend on clean fuel, uh, that is why the government also additionally supported over 80 million households with access to clean fuel, free of cost for three months. So uh, I feel that the economic approach uh, with regards to this pandemic was multifold. On one hand, the government ensured that there was health facilities in the government structure adequate enough to meet the needs, especially of the poor or the lower middle class. Uh, also, like I said, the free ration, free fuel, the cash transfers aided uh, in terms of solutions, the disruption, or for that matter, the, the kind of challenges that the government had foreseen on the rural and the, and the poor population. But uh, I must here add that when it comes to industry, we saw, uh, we saw a, a plethora of financial aids and packages given. We had over, and I can just say, uh, as per the figures available currently, over 2,000 billion Indian rupees was sanctioned to around 8 million borrowers in the SME segment alone. We also had in our farm economy over 5 million uh, credit cards given, especially to our farming community, so that they have working capital available to them during the time of, of distress. Additional capital funding for farmers was made available through other non-banking financial institutions and companies across our country. So I feel that one cannot look at solutions from a particular silo to understand that to meet this pandemic and to bear the brunt of the economic fallout of the pandemic globally, uh, our government ensured that we are dedicated across all facilities of governance to help shield our citizens. But as Minister Singapore has said, that till such time we do not look at those nations that envelop, as I said before, the, uh, the definition of developing countries, global economy and its resurgence post-pandemic uh, will continue to be a challenge. We need to work not only as a global economy, but as a global family. And when you talk about the global family, then you understand that there will be restrictions, yes, there will be challenges, yes, but at least our minds will be met in terms of finding solutions that are applicable and viable for all. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, Governor Kuroda, we, we heard an incredibly impressive array of emergency measures coming out of India and similar things have been done around the world. How quickly do you think governments and central banks should be aiming to get back to more normal monetary and fiscal policies? Is that even mm. going to be possible? Mm. Yes, uh, we expect that uh, fiscal uh, 2020 uh, ending uh, this March, would see uh, negative 5.6% uh, growth. That is 5.6% uh, contraction. But then in fiscal 2021, we expect uh, nearly 4% uh, uptown uh, positive growth. And in fiscal 2022, nearly 2% economic growth. So we expect uh, probably uh, by the end of uh, uh, fiscal 2021 or early fiscal 22, uh, the Japanese economy would uh, uh, recover and come back to the level prevailed before the uh, pandemic uh, started. Uh, but of course, uh, two points we have to uh, uh, remember. One, uh, we have to avoid what uh, you call scaring effect uh, by many uh, uh, measures, I think. And second, uh, we have to uh, encourage uh, sort of uh, post-COVID uh, new uh, economic uh, uh, way of uh, doing business and so on so forth. For instance, uh, under the pandemic situation, many companies started uh, 
telework and so on and so forth. And the universities also started to pay uh, uh, education and so on and so forth. So uh, I do think that uh, digitalization uh, must be further uh, uh, promoted and that would uh, provide some uh, impetus to further economic growth and development. Another is, uh, is uh, uh, greening the economy or what you call uh, sustainable economic development. That is, of course, uh, quite important uh, uh, even before the pandemic, but now it's more important and also it would uh, uh, make our economy more sustainable. And at the same time, it would provide some growth impetus to the economy. So I think uh, two points I, I mentioned are quite, quite important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Kostin, how are you uh, at VTB and in Russia more generally thinking about how things are going to be different if and when this pandemic emerges? I mean, uh, Governor Kuroda pointed to a couple of things, digitalization, uh, more emphasis on gr the green economy. Are those the kinds of themes that are also important where you are? Yes, I'm sure. Uh, definitely um, during pandemic, uh, we saw a very quick uh, development of uh, digitalization uh, in banking very much, not only in uh, uh, trading in, uh, in many other areas. The companies which provided uh, those services, they grew 25% sometime during this year. But uh, when people are, are telling me, oh, that's how, how good, you see, we can, we can work from home, we can save uh, expenses on office space, and it's very convenient, you know, you shouldn't travel in, 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 the, in the bad traffic uh, to, to meet the guy, uh, to meet anybody, you, you, just, you just have to talk uh, online. I don't believe that the humanity would like to live such a way. I, I, I know that my staff, for example, who spent, uh, some of them spent nearly six months working from their offices at home. They, they hate it. They, they say, why, when we come back to the office? I think, again, uh, my, my opinion that we should more focus on how to protect ourselves from viruses and to live a normal life rather than trying to focus on how we can live more comfortable under, under pandemic. Uh, that, that, that's my issue. But definitely, yes, um, many, many things became evident that we can do. We can save on expenses. We can save time. Uh, on on um, on different uh, digitalization digitalization processes. On the other hand, I think there's also some uh, some um, uh, threats and some risks. For example, we see that some digital companies, which uh, never had any positive financial results, are traded now uh, or they list at the stock exchange with a value of billions of dollars though they produce, as I say, no positive results. And a lot of expectations and a lot of speculative, I think, expectations, which might lead to the financial bubbles of such companies, digital companies, which are now exploiting the situation when everybody thinks, yeah, next year there'll be another growth of digital products and digital companies and so on and so forth. So I, I think we should be very careful about this uh, while having a, a quite, um, um, positive uh, pro expectations for, for, for the digital processes. Yes, so I think, I don't think that we will have a very different life after the pandemic. I think the digital process, uh, it, it's taken place for, for some time already, but definitely um, the crisis, the COVID crisis, they speed up all these processes and show that, that we can uh, solve many uh, issues and some business issues uh, mm -hmm. with the digital uh, solutions. Okay, thank you very much. Now we've got a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, so I'll put a, a couple of those to you now. Uh, the first one um, from Louisa Chang at HSBC. She says, are we going into the fifth industrial revolution when workforces can no longer be working together due to social distancing and we all need to adapt to a new way of working? Now, Mr. Costin just kind of expressed his opinion that he thinks people won't want that and that that's probably overblown but um who, who wants to have a go at that um in taman in singapore you've always been a very sort of plugged in digital techno advanced society do you think that's where we're going 
Well, we were already uh, going there. And what COVID has done is to um, uh, fast forward that process. Um, I don't think we'll ever be going back to uh, the old world of retail, uh, the old world of a whole range of uh, human facing services. But uh, it's not going to be like the last year when you literally had a lockdown of large tracts of the service economy. I think some hybrid economy is already evolving. Uh, people will need to be with each other and see each other uh, ever so often. Uh, but remote work is here to stay. And we've got to ensure uh, that that doesn't lead to a greater inequality uh, between the knowledge professionals and others who can easily adapt to remote work and the blue collar workers and, and others uh, who really have to be at work. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it has implications, not just in terms of uh, job opportunities and pay, but even for the quality of life. So adapting our whole workforce to, the, to this new hybrid economy of the future, particularly in services. I think manufacturing will get back to normal uh, and is already back to normal for many, many parts of the manufacturing sector. But adapting a whole workforce uh, to the use of digital technologies, uh, to be able to um, make the most in their own jobs um, of, of these technologies is extremely important. So a central task of government everywhere in the world, working in partnership with unions, with corporates, with industry associations, and with training institutions, is to continually gear people across our workforces to these need, needs of the future, so that you get a new phase of inclusive growth rather than one that favors one group and, and leaves out another. Thanks. And there's a question that's quite closely related to that, and that I think is a good one for Minister Irani in Delhi, because it, it's uh, from, it's a, the question is, those who are able to adapt new ways of work are readjusting to what we call the new normal. But what are the unskilled and least educated segments would love to hear what your respective governments are working on to support them. And that's from Sikanda of the Forum Global Shapers Community in Karachi. I think I'll join Khoiz with what Minister Singapore said with regards to the challenge that as technology expands in our workspace, we have to be diligent to ensure that those who don't have the technological skills are not dispossessed of opportunities. And I feel that the pandemic, what it's done in India, has been uh, quite amazing because six years ago, the Prime Minister had given a clarion call for digital India. And then since uh, it was a new... Um, solution. It was a new pathway. There were many Indians who were circumspect as to how many Indians can possibly come into the technology fold. And uh, I think what the pandemic has thrown up is surprising results. We have now digital transactions only in the month of December, which peaked at over 2 billion transactions on, on a financial instrument called UPI. And most of the transactions have happened in the rural segment of our economy, where people presumed they will not be technologically adept. So uh, I think that challenges such as the pandemic have, uh, uh, you know, given human beings an opportunity to test their resilience. And insofar as skills, I also feel that with the disruption in uh, manufacturing segments and various other segments of our economy, uh, or for that matter, economies worldwide, there will now be an introspective methodology there. I think which will come to the fore with regards to how we need to upskill uh, some of our workforce. I'll give you a very small example. In, in the month of March, uh, there was a need prescribed for PPE suits for our frontline workers. And India had never, ever uh, produced, manufactured even one PPE suit in our uh, over 70 years of uh, independent history. And in just 30 days, we turned around the entire PPE suit manufacturing processes. We reoriented our apparel industry to manufacture PPE suits. And in three months, we became the second largest exporters in the world. And in three months, we gave rise to an industry over a billion dollars. Uh, from zero companies, we went to uh, 1,100 companies. Now, that is because the challenge brought an opportunity that was converted by the industry, by technologists, by scientists, and government. So I feel that wherever governments are uh, not only 
now assertive with regards to ensuring that the skill needs of the industry and of our citizens are met you will see that the adaptability with regards to uh, the pandemic has been much faster uh, but i also uh, second what our representative from russia has said that nobody likes to always sit at home and type away at a screen uh, they have human beings have thrived always in contact in conversations so as minister singapore said we are looking forward to a world with a hybrid model possibly but what is incumbent upon us is to ensure that that skill set is uh, made available to all citizens mostly in india under the prime minister's leadership we have an entity called a common service center which has reached to every rural block in our country and provides digital literacy now and uh, close to uh, over 6 million citizens have already been made digitally literate under this program so there is hope for the digital future of india in those citizens and that administrative establishment Thanks very much. Um Governor Karoda, I don't know what you think about this question that we've just been talking about about a, a more permanent shift to remote working. If you have comments on that and also another question, perhaps a slightly more philosophical one from Leslie Johnston of the Lords Foundation. It says in our natural systems continuous growth is not possible. Why then do we as global citizens continue to see growth as the as the answer? given that we're exceeding the environmental boundaries is degrowth uh, a more sustainable option yeah maybe <clears throat> i as i said uh, uh, this uh, digitalization is uh, quite uh, uh, important critically important in coming years and the government has uh, decided to establish a digital agency uh, within the government which would promote uh, digitalization in the private sector as well as in the public sector and uh, i think this shows uh, how important uh, digitalization or the application of uh, information and uh, communication technology to uh, every aspect of uh, economic activities but now uh, one of my uh, university professor my friends told me that uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 months or so his university uh, of course uh, <coughs> used uh, a remote uh, way of uh, lecturing and and so on and so forth and uh, uh, that w- that was uh, quite quite efficient according to his assessment but at the same time he told me that uh, face to face discussion uh, education uh, would continue to be quite important so he said that uh, the mixture uh, hybrid of uh, uh, remote uh, education and face to face education would be uh, the way uh, his university uh, is uh, likely to go i think this uh, kind of hybrid uh, system as again uh, minister taman emphasized is uh, is inevitable uh, although of course uh, in many aspect of economic activities uh, digitalization remote way of work and so on so forth would Uh, develop further, but at the same time, uh, we think that uh, this uh, face-to-face uh, uh, communication, face-to-face interaction, uh, face-to-face service uh, uh, would uh, uh, be uh, quite important. Now, on the second, uh, somewhat philosophical question, I. I tend to think that, of course, uh, we have uh, resource constraint, environmental constraint, and so so forth. But uh, those constraints, uh, human beings, uh, the world, has been overcoming through uh, technology and uh, and scientific uh, uh, development. And I, I'm I'm glad to be optimistic about the ability of the. Uh, human being to uh, further um, uh, make uh, progress in 
science and, and, and technology development so that we could continue uh, uh, world growth in coming years and decades. Thank you very much, Governor. Now we've got about five minutes left. Uh, I'm going to put two of the questions to Mr. Costin and he can perhaps choose the one that he'd, he'd like to respond to. And then hopefully we'll all have like 30 seconds to have a, a last thought. But uh, Mr. Costin, one question is, is there a risk that global supply chains are nationalized to ensure national control? And then the second one is uh, something you've alluded to already. It says uh, that the World Economic Forum risk report highlights asset bubbles as one of the top 10 risks. And is that risk even greater because of the expansionary fiscal and monetary policy that everybody is using at the moment? Uh, yes. You can yeah, answer I mean, either or both of those questions. Well, the first question is, 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 is a quick answer. I think not. Um, but uh, the second question is, is quite very important. And I think, yes, there's a risk. Uh, because continuing the policy uh, like we have today, very, very soft uh, policy, monetary policy, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't last for, for, for too long. We already, uh, since, uh, effectively, since the crisis 2006, 2007, 2009, we, we have this policy. But it, it should stop one day because there's too much money, there's a, a too cheap money. And, and on, the other way, on the other side, we are losing the value of money because for, for, for investors, for uh, for people who have money, you know, it's, it's ridiculous that you keep your money in the bank or you're buying the uh, government bond and you have to, uh, have to pay for this. That is not normal. Uh, the money should have some value. On the other hand, there's too much money, there's too cheap money. And of course, I mentioned before, there's a, some bubble particular on the, in my opinion, on the, on the high tech uh, companies with the great expectations of the further growth but purely uh, on speculating on the further uh, stock um, uh, price growth rather than anything else. So I think we should be very careful. We, we faced a situation in the mortgage uh, 12 years ago. Uh, I think we should be very careful uh, again uh, now. Okay, yeah, well, it has been one of the stranger things of this year, this surge in the stock markets at the time when we've got this unprecedented crisis. Okay, we've got about too much uh, three money, minutes. Too much money. Yeah. Let me just give you all a chance to uh, to summarise and perhaps a sort of starter question, but take it where you will. We've had this uh, unprecedented year. Do you think we're going to get 2021 is going to look something more normal uh, or, or not? Are we still going to be in the middle of a crisis? Uh, Taman? Well, I'll, I'll take the question as going beyond 2021, because I think 21 is just a transition. And the question is, what new normal are we getting to? The failures that uh, were evident in the last year were not new. They're failures of the international system that um, we've understood for a long time, but they point to the priorities for the future. We must shore up the multilateral system. We must rebuild some forms of cooperative internationalism, not just out of the goodness of our hearts, but out of every nation's self-interest. There is such a thing as mutual interest, and we have failed to act in our mutual interest on global health care. We are still failing to act in mutual interest on climate change. We're failing to act on mutual interest in a whole range of global public goods, they're global public goods because they don't just benefit one country or several, they benefit all countries. And that's the key lesson coming out of this crisis. We have greatly underfunded global public goods. And healthcare is a classic example. Greatly underfunded, reacting only after the crisis, and reacting in a very fragmented fashion. So we've got to address that forthrightly because this is not the last pandemic we're going to have. It's not the large, last global crisis we're going to have. And it's going to be far less costly to invest in multilateralism and to invest in global public goods. It's going to be far less costly than having to pay the cost of the crises that keep recurring because we have failed to invest in international cooperation. It's just far more costly. If you look at how much this crisis has cost countries individually, it's huge multiples of the cost that was required to simply make our due payments for the international system. 
Okay, Minister Irani, is that the question of the conclusion you draw to more international cooperation? Absolutely. I think those who made predictions about the year 2020 will possibly bite their tongue before making pronouncement for 21. But uh, as the only lady on the panel, let me uh, say this. In India, we uh, learned uh, very richly from our experience of cooperative federalism. As an Indian, let alone a minister, I'm extremely proud of the fact how citizens and government rallied together that there was no sense of despair, however, a sense that we will overcome no matter what the challenge the pandemic throws up. And I second what Minister Singapore says, that this is a time for us to invest in each other because year after year, we lived as a global community from one achievement to another. And there was absolutely no uh, recognition of the fact that the future can be so uncertain that it'll throw out of the window every achievement, be it in technology, in science, or for that matter, in areas of defense. And I think this pandemic has given many in economies and communities an opportunity to introspect that it is as wise to invest in your own resources, your own nations, as it is to invest in the global community. So I'm hopeful that this introspection that has been deliberate because of the pandemic in 2020, 2019, late 2019, is giving us an opportunity to come together to recognize that yes, technology is important, but as important is that human interface that has benefited us as, as economies, as countries. And I'm grateful for this dialogue because I think that it leaves that telling question behind. Is the pandemic and its impact really still behind us? Are we really looking forward to a new normal or are we still adjusting to the despair that was thrown up by the pandemic? I'm hopeful that we will go from despair to new hope. Thank you very much indeed. And I um, should apologise to Mr. Costin and Mr. Corrodo because I'm getting urgent messages from World Economic Forum headquarters that I've got to wrap it up before we crash some uh, digital barrier. So let me just thank you all for a kind of fascinating discussion. It's been really great to be able to link up and let's hope we can all meet in person next year. But for now, thank you very much all.